You are listening to season 2 of the Humans of AI Stories Not Stats podcast. Where Devi Parikh and Dhruv Patra talk to AI researchers to try and understand who they are as people, what their life is like, what they think about, what they're insecure about, and what they get really excited about. Questions that reveal the stories of their day-to-day life. In this episode, Dhruv talks with Charles Lee Isbell Jr., who is a computationalist, a researcher, and an educator. He has been a professor at Georgia Tech's College of Computing since 2002 and since July 2019 is the John P Imlay Jr Dean of the college. Charles talks about waking up at the right time without needing an alarm, thinking of failures and rejections as learning experiences, the difference between empathy and sympathy in his work, the importance for long-term vision in life and lots more. For more information about the podcast, you can log on to www.humanstories.ai. And with that, let's get right into the conversation. Okay, Charles as well. Welcome to Humans of AI. Thank you for doing this. Um, Thank you for having me. I have a sequence of questions for you. Um, some are lightweight and may not require much thought. Um, others may require a bit more consideration. In which case, please feel free to take your time to pause, think. We can skip questions if you'd like to. Um, but when in doubt, if you can err on the side of being open. transparent vulnerable we would appreciate it does that sound good sounds good to me happy to do it okay so what were you doing right before this call well so you guys i was having a lunch with a colleague and we were discussing the wonders of bureaucracy and enjoying um a a cake she actually bakes uh dessert uh a couple times a week i guess and there's a group of us used to get together for lunch but because it's Um, just before a holiday, a lot of people aren't around, but we discovered that uh, we were both here today. I normally am not in, uh, uh, and so we grabbed uh, some lunch together, and, and she brought delicious chocolate almond honey based cake. Interesting. Sounds sounds yummy. <laughs> oh, it was delicious. What is what is a typical day in your life like? What is your daily routine like? Okay, so I, there's a couple ways to answer that question, uh, but let me answer it this way. So first off, there is no typical day, right? Uh, every day is different uh, because basically we're running around and solving problems. Uh, but uh, there's another way to answer the question. Let me just sort of take it at, at face value. There's uh, what life is like when we aren't in the middle of a pandemic, and there's what life is like when we are in the middle of a pandemic. And right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but we're still. dealing with that. So right now in the pandemic world, uh, I spend a lot of time in meetings. I'm definitely overscheduled. There's a lot of we got to get together for this meeting, get together for this meeting. I would show you my calendar, but I don't want to scare you, but looking at just this week, um there's only there's not a single free spot uh, on my on my calendar until uh tomorrow afternoon. Um I I have my first meetings between 7:30 and 8:00 a.m. uh today my last meeting will end at 6 p.m. so there's lots of lots and lots of meetings when we are in the middle of a pandemic uh i still have lots of meetings but many of them are less scheduled so there's always a fire to put out there's always an interesting thing to think about uh there's always a quick meeting someone wants to have and so my free space is sort of filled up with lots of interesting conversations sometimes about research and professor side of my life and sometimes about administration and the the dean side of my life. Uh so a typical day is there's some set of problems to solve and it takes people getting together to solve them and so we get together and we do it. And what's the favorite part of your day? Oh, uh that's an interesting question. I I find myself enjoying the parts where I can think. And sometimes that thinking involves other people, often it does. uh sometimes that thinking involves me being off on a corner and alone and staring into space but any time i get a moment to think about a problem and try to come up with something interesting is a, a good part of the day for me and conversely what's the least favorite part of your day the part when i don't get to do that <laughs> there's there's a problem that's in front of me so when i say i like to to solve problems implicit in that is that they're interesting problems occasionally i have uninteresting problems put in front of me i don't enjoy uninteresting problems those are just obstacles the obstacles need to go away the problems that's something that requires a little bit of thought a little bit of help being a little clever that i find enjoyable but if i have to sit down and do something just because i have to sit down and do it i don't like that at all do you set an alarm in the morning hmm 
Do you set an alarm in the morning? I do set an alarm in the morning, but it doesn't matter. I always wake up before the alarm. Hmm. I have this, uh, someone once told me that this is true of about 10% of the population. I have no idea if that's true or not. But before I go to bed, if I look at the clock and I say to myself, I will wake up by this time. I always wake up by that time. It's just, it's always been true of me since, at least since I was a teenager. So I'll set the alarm, but I always wake up almost exactly five minutes before the alarm, whenever it is that I set it. You, you may, I don't know, maybe you, you will believe this, maybe you won't, but I grew up with my mother telling me that as just a thing, she had that ability, she could just do that. She tried to impart that ability by describing it to me. It never quite worked for me, but it was fascinating for me to watch her where she would be just like, you know, 6 a.m. or 6.15, and she would always be up before that. Yeah, it's just, it's something that's always been true of me. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'm a morning person. Right. So people will say things like, well, you can do this because you're a morning person. I'm a night person. That's not really what it is. Morning person does not mean uh, you you are at your best in the morning. It means you're at your best when you first wake up. Right. Which could be three o'clock in the morning or could be 10 a.m. in the morning, which is more like what it was when I was in school. Um, It's just that when I wake up in the morning, it goes from this to this. There's no there's no Mm -hmm. transition. There's no. You know, other people I know describe waking up as a painful stage process that they do not enjoy. Now, by contrast, when I go to sleep at night, it is a very inelegant transition. I go from being awake and and making coherent sentences to just being incoherent, not quite knowing what's going on. And then eventually I fall asleep. I go to sleep pretty quickly. But if I'm trying to stay awake, it just kind of all collapses. It's not not a very elegant transition at all. And I just think this whole I can wake up when I want to. Uh, kind of kind of goes along with that hmm. um, as I want to wake up that's that's sort of where I'm happy I'm actually curious uh, how it how it looked on your side of the world because for me it's a very specific thing it's not that I say I will wake up at 6 15 I have to figure out how much time it is so it is now 11 p.m uh-huh. I want to wake up at 6 a.m that's seven hours so hmm. I will sleep for seven hours hmm. if I say I'll sleep until 6 a.m it doesn't work. It has to be the number of hours. And I don't know what that means. And I don't know why it's that way, but it's been like that for me for 30 odd years. Yeah. Uh, for me personally, um, I know eight is my comfortable spot. And so regardless of when I sp- sleep, that plus eight is generally I'll wake up happy and without an alarm uh, if mm-hmm. needed. Um, I don't quite know whether my my mother was or is calculating in her head uh, the number of hours or, or a specific time. Uh, I'll ask her the next time I, I talk to her. Yeah, it, that's the only way it works for me. Yeah. Um, do you consider yourself or do you operate uh, as a planning person or do you prefer going with the flow, with gut feel, where you have an intuition for things? Well, you can only plan plans. You can't plan outcomes, right? So... I, having said that, I tend to think of myself as a planner. In fact, the, the, so I applied to one place as an undergrad because that's where I wanted to go. I applied to three places for grad school uh, because people told me I should apply to more than one place. Uh, but I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a computer scientist when I was eight years old. I knew where I wanted to go to school. I knew I wanted to be a professor before I got to high school. Um, now, to be clear, I didn't know what any of this meant. I just knew that's that's what I wanted. Um, and I tended to know very sort of early on what it is I wanted to do many, many years out in the future. It wasn't until I was a junior in college that I realized this wasn't true of everybody else, that people switched majors and were searching around for what they wanted to do. I, I didn't realize that until, until relatively late. I think a lot of people, when I tell them that, think, well, that's really, you're very lucky. That's very amazing. And and so on. And, and there's some truth to that. That is, it is nice to be sure uh, of what you want and to be able to work towards it. And that's the sort of planner side of me. On the other hand, uh, it does have some downsides. And the main one is you tend to live for the future as opposed to the present. So, you know, I know the thing that I'm doing is going to set me up to do the thing that I'm doing. And therefore, I'm doing the thing that I'm doing. But for that reason, uh, and I'm waiting for the day when I don't know what I want to do next, because I get the feeling I'm not I'm not going to know what to do with myself because I'm always doing something for two steps down the down, two steps down the road, um, and I don't know what life is like without it. So the answer is yes, I'm a planner. You react to things that are going on uh, as they're going on because you know 
all plans, no plan survives contact with the enemy, right? So you, you have to be able to adjust. But yeah, the, the high order bit is, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it work for this next year and the year after that. And that's just sort of how I operate. Things must make sense. It must be predictable. And, and are they general? No, but <laughs> I mean, you can usually make things make sense. And, yeah. uh, and you can often predict in broad swaths and you can plan for those things. And so long as you are flexible, it sort of works out. So I'm a planner through and through. Sounds good. Do you struggle with procrastination? Well, I wouldn't say I'd struggle with it. I'd say we're good friends. So uh, I don't think of, you know, I'm deadline driven. Uh, you know, one of my, my favorite things to say, I say it to my students and I, I, I say it to, to my kids even, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with waiting until the last minute. The secret is knowing when the last minute is, right? So for me, I procrastinate. I try to procrastinate in ways that I actually end up accomplishing something else that I was putting off otherwise. So, you know, my house gets very clean and I'm trying not to write something that I'm supposed to be writing. Uh, and I get a lot of writing done uh, when um, I don't want to clean my house, right? So I, I kind of hope it sort of balances and, and works out. So I don't think of it as a struggle. I just think of it as a way of life. And yes, I am a last minute kind of person and I will put off things that I absolutely do not want to do until I absolutely need to do them. And, but I still try to get them done. Are you competitive? I mean, <laughs> why do you think there's someone better at it than me? Um, <laughs> I I think I don't think of myself as competitive, but I suspect that many many people around me do. So I'm going to say I like to do well, and that probably seems like uh, being competitive. And so I'm willing to accept the label. But you know, for me, it's mostly around: um, Am I doing as well as I think I, I can do and need to do? Right, and it's so it's not about beating someone else. It's about um, you know getting to the place where where you want to be. And so yes, I'm competitive in that sense, uh, but I don't see it as a zero sum game. Maybe that's the right way to think about it. Mm. I might be competing, but there's no zero sum game that I'm playing. Mm. And so with that mindset, um, is there a particular rejection or failure mm. that hurt particularly bad? Um, I'm going to say no, and I'm going to say no, because I always felt as if in the end, the right thing happened. So, you know, there's the feeling in the moment and there's the feeling that, you know, you're going to have later now, you know, maybe that's delusion. Maybe it's just a story you tell yourself to justify whatever happened to you. I don't know. And frankly, I don't think it matters. I think what, what matters is if it's so long as it's a learning experience and it's able to prepare you for the next thing, then you just kind of have to assume that the outcome was the right outcome or at least a good enough outcome for where does you want to go. Uh, so I try not to feel that way uh, when things don't go the way that I want them to go or as quickly as I want them to go. Um, there are very few things where the stakes are so high that uh, it's actually mattered. On the other hand, maybe I can just say that because things do seem, seem to have mostly worked out. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I, maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have been in a position where the things that have happened that I've wanted to happen have been good and the things that haven't happened, you know, a door immediately opened up and there was you know, another option and another thing that would, would be fine. But I think that attitude is useful. I, I think, you know, you have to, I mean, think about it this way. Once you recognize that most of the universe is outside of your control uh, and the things that are kind of happening are, are, are beyond you, you can influence it. You, of course, are, you have autonomy, you have agency, but there are all these things that are happening. There are more possible good outcomes than there are possible bad outcomes if you are trying, if you know what you want and you're trying to move through, then not getting one thing or another or not having a particular, you know, getting rejected for something you wanted or not having something happen you wanted doesn't matter so much, right? You're walking down the, the hall, you have to make a left or a right turn. It doesn't matter which way you go. You made a left turn. If you had made a right turn, you might have bumped into somebody and, and you know, you're a billionaire and you, you know, you're the owner of Amazon. Or you might have been hit by a car. And there's kind of no way of knowing. So you might as well assume, look, at the end of the day, the right thing 
is happening. Things are going along pretty well. They might have been better. They certainly might have been worse. So it's fine. So being turned down, that's okay. It, it means, or having a rejection, it's okay because you've set up the world so that there's a next thing that you can do uh, that will also be just fine and just okay. So there you go. I feel like I didn't answer your question, but- No, no, but I, I think that 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 mindset was valuable, uh, even if, and, and, it, and it made sense why you didn't answer that question in the presence of that mindset, because there probably wasn't something that felt particularly bad, given that you already have that mindset. Yeah. My my follow-up question would be, did you have to work at this mindset or did, did this come naturally to you? Oh, I have no idea if it came naturally to me or not, but it feels like, <laughs> feels like it did, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, I don't know. I feel like the most important thing, there's, everything's balanced, right? And and the, 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 the key thing is to figure out how to sort of balance, well, there's lots of key things, but the key thing with respect to this question is trying to balance self-reflection, trying to figure out what you did well or what you did poorly or why you feel the way you feel about something uh, versus um, just, you know, and doing that right without getting mired into the details and regret and how things might have might have gone differently, right? If you don't reflect enough, then you're not learning enough and you end up in a bad place that was easily avoidable. If you reflect too much, you're paralyzed. This is why the I make a left turn and make a right turn, all outcomes are going to be good, or at least all possibilities are good. So there's no point in thinking about it too much. Go with, you know, your gut, which presumably you've developed over the years, right? You, you're, you're not making guesses, you're making informed guesses, right? Um, so once you decide that the universe is, you know, arcs in such a way that it's probably going to be okay, ultimately, then it's a lot easier to kind of relax through these things. And I, and I think it's a kind of mindset you, you come to, but again, it's easy for me to say, I've had a lot of suboptimal things happen to me in life. Uh, but I've had a lot of great things happen to me in life. And maybe if I had many fewer of the latter and many more of the former, I would feel very differently about this, but I've lived the life that I've lived so, so far. <laughs> So to, uh, yes, uh, engaging in tautologies. Uh. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so to follow up on that last point, though, um, you found a way to deal with the lows. <clears throat> but what about the highs? Uh, is there a particular achievement or success that felt particularly good that, that you remember that lingered? Oh, man, there's so many. It's, you know, it's, it's so I've had a bunch of personal uh, personal achievements that that I, I've had that, that make me feel really good or made me feel really good in the moment. Um, I, I will tell you, I mean, this this feels like both log rolling and kind of obvious, but I love being the dean of the College of Computing. Um, I, I just, I, I love Georgia Tech. I love what I'm doing. Uh, I love having a chance to have a kind of impact on the world uh, in a field that I think that matters and is becoming more and more important. Um, and that is, that's been really exciting for me. I've gotten awards I didn't expect and that's been very exciting for me. Uh, I've gotten awards I've expected. That's been very exciting. Uh, you know, but when I think about the things that I really ap appreciated about sort of things that you might want to call achievements, it's been the ones where it feels like there's an impact that will kind of live out beyond what the moment is, right? Um, I've, I've actually been thinking about this a lot over the years and, and you know, what I really want is immortality, right? Which I kind of think is what everybody really wants. They really want immortality, right? And kind of the closest thing you can get to immortality is your great grandchildren knowing who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And very few of us do. I think almost none of us know who our great grandparents were, or many of us don't even know who our grandparents' full names were, right? I mean, you know, and, and if anything that I can do that seems to have impacted a person, or a group of people, or change the direction of an organization or something so that it'll be different. Um, I felt good about that. Uh, you know, hopefully it's been positive and I, I've sort of felt, I felt good about that. <clears throat> and so to directly answer your question then, uh, I think my, the biggest achievement I felt is my children, right? Because they will, you know, uh, have an impact on the world. I'm seeing it happen now. And you know, hopefully their children and their children's children and so on, they're they're touching the world. And that's just been such a joy to to watch, to just kind of see them grow into their own individual people and and go out and kind of sort of touch the world. And um it's it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. And to know that I had something to do with 
but nowhere near everything you do. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, what is one thing that you are worse at compared to the people around you? That I'm worse at? Mm-hmm. Uh, besides giving short answers? Um, <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> no, actually, uh, I've, I'm, I'm around enough faculty to know that there are people who can give even longer answers than I can. Um, so, so I'll tell you, it, it's a, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. I actually think I am much better than others at empathy, but I am not necessarily better than others at sympathy. Hmm. Most people, it's the other way around, right? And I, I, I tend to, I think, like many people who do the kinds of things that actually we both do, uh, tend to be tend to make the world um, a problem to solve, right? Which sort of drains the emotional impact, unless you explicitly think about it that way, tends to drain the emotional impact of the decisions that you make out of it. So it becomes very easy to solve the problem without thinking about the human cost or even the human benefit. You know, the problem got put in front of you, you solve the problem, you don't worry about it, as opposed to asking yourself whether it's even the right problem to solve. And I think that my strength is being, or a strength is being pretty good at understanding where people are coming from but which a lot of people can't do unless they experience it themselves or someone they love experiences it. Mm. I think you could describe a lot of politics in the world and history as being that problem of not being able to empathize with others. But on the other hand, there's the sympathy part. Whereas it's not just that I understand, but I feel what you feel. And I, I sort of feel sorry, or I can, I can, you know, internal. And um, I think that there are people who do a lot of the things that I do who are better at sympathy than I am, um, even if I'm pretty good at empathy. And so I always have to remind myself explicitly to think through how people will feel about what we're doing and making certain that they're a part of the conversation um, and at least are heard. Uh, And that requires constant reminding and work uh, to do because it's not something, it's not the natural thing that happens at least not for me. I, it's clearly natural for others. Uh, but for me, I have to think very hard about it. And to be clear, I'm not saying I'm a heartless, uh, emotionless automaton. Um, I mean, maybe I am, but that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but that it, you know, it, it's something that you, I, I have to be very clear and think very much about as opposed to just solving the problem because the problem is to be solved. Yeah, yeah. No, I think even your earlier answer without the clarification, uh, I don't think had that risk of you coming across as a heartless heartless automaton, specifically when you pointed out your strength of empathy, which I I think I know what you mean. In my brief interactions with you, I I think I I kind of understand what you mean. And and your your talk at NeurIPS was a a good uh, insight into that kind of thinking. Yeah. I appreciate that. How do you usually make difficult decisions? Are there lines of thinking that you find yourself using and and falling back into? You know, it it helps to have a goal in mind. It helps to have a vision. It helps to have a long-term thing that you want to do. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. These are the things that I can always fall back on. So, you know, if there's one thing I care a lot about, at least in, well, even in the research side of my life, it, it's about vision. There's this thing I'm trying to do, and it's okay if it's going to take decades or if it's going to happen long after I'm gone. Um, there's something I'm trying to accomplish. So being able to return to kind of your North Star uh, becomes very important. So when I have difficult decisions to make, uh, I always try to at least reflect on, well, what is it we're ultimately trying to accomplish here? And I have found that saying it out loud to yourself and to the others who are involved in the conversations with you is very important um, because it reminds us all of what we're doing again. And it's a, it's a, it's a mechanism for not falling into the trap of just solving the problem that's in front of you, uh, which is pretty easy to do, pretty easy trap to fall into. And we're all trained to do it anyway. Right? Uh, so this, this is a kind of thing that I try to think through. What is it I'm ultimately trying to accomplish? Can I, um, can I see how the decisions I'm making now and the different outcomes will either further that or set it back. And will it set it back in the long term or just in the short term? And you, you try to do it. You're not always successful. 
successful at it. Um, and sometimes you just have to make the decisions you have to make or all the decisions are bad and the constraints are beyond your control. But in general, if you can see how it's going to, to help you to get to the place where you think you need to go um, and where you're trying to move the organization or, where, or the impact you're trying to have on the world, then, then yeah. Um, that, that's it. You got to have a. You have to have a true uh, a true north. You have to have a uh, a place that you're trying to get to. Because otherwise, it doesn't matter. It, you, you know, you you got just pick the thing that is locally optimal and don't worry about whether it's globally optimal. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is why I do reinforcement learning for a living. Right? <laughs> That's good. Expected reward. My goal is to maximize long term expected reward. Was there any <laughs> other answer you had? <laughs> I, I, I kind of knew, I'm surprised we, we waited till like question 10 to get to reinforcement learning references. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that the reinforcement learning references were in the very first question. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, I believe what we are engaging in now is uh, hindsight experience replay or like hindsight goal re relabeling. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> what, what else is there? <laughs> Okay. Um, do you have an internal monologue? Do you find yourself talking? Do you have an internal voice? Do you talk to yourself? Um, I certainly do when I'm playing sports. Mm. I think I I find myself from my I, I think the answer is I have an occasional internal monologue that it the a voice that speaks up when I'm trying to remind myself what to do in a particular moment. But most of the time, the internal voice is quiet. At least that's how I experience it. Um, uh, but I don't know. I'd, I'd have to actually have to think a lot more about that. But I think the answer is uh, I must because it speaks up. Maybe I'm just not listening to it most of the time. Maybe that's, maybe that's what's happening. Uh, but I do occasionally uh, sit there and go, Charles, you need to do this. Or this is the thing that you have to do. Or what is it I... What is it I really need to do next? So maybe I'm just talking out loud when I, when I do that. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I want to say occasionally. Hmm. And, and it's, in, it's in English. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to dream in Spanish. Interesting. Yes. As a, when I was a, so I, I started learning Spanish um, in eighth grade. And um, I actually minored in Spanish. So my, I did my undergrad in what was then called information and computer science. But I minored in uh, what we would now call cognitive science, but we didn't at the time, uh, Spanish and history of the 1960s. And uh, when I was fluent, which was a long time ago, so it turns out if you don't speak a language for like 15 or 20 years, you like lose some of the vocabulary. Uh, but I used to dream in Spanish. It was great. I don't anymore. Uh, but yes, it's a, insofar as there is an inner voice, it is definitely in English. Interesting. It wasn't always. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and and the, the, the dreams in Spanish involved other people speaking Spanish as well and you conversing in Spanish. That's how I interpreted it. Hmm. Um, you know, you know, dreams, like dreams have their own logic, right? Like it's not even clear there, there's dialogue happening. Yeah, like, there's it's just... more like dialogue happened. Uh, and, and yeah, I thought of them as happening in Spanish. It's kind of like when I used to speak uh, multiple languages, well, really just Spanish uh, and English. So long as I didn't think about the fact that I was speaking in the language, it worked. And the moment I realized I was speaking in the language, it would fall apart because I would start translating in my head. Hmm. Uh, it was a lot like that. It, it didn't feel like, it wasn't so much that I was speaking in Spanish or people around me were speaking in Spanish. It was that things were happening in Spanish. Yep. They, were just, they just were. And there was no real distinction other than occasionally the realization that it was happening in Spanish. And are you a visual thinker? Do you think in pictures, diagrams, search trees? I think in abstract graphs. Okay. okay imagine circles and dots and, and whatever, and they occasionally have a kind of like visual thing in front of me, but it's, it's about relationships. I, I think in relationships, I think, hmm. and abstractions. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, you will know this, but there's a, um, you know, there's a web page that has the org chart for the College of Computing. I make that org chart. I'm, I see. I, I find the pictures. I change the layout. All of that is me. Because Why? I, Why? Because <laughs> I like it. So for two reasons. One, it means I actually know who's in the college, uh, which I used to know everything, but 
I don't know, as time goes on, you just know fewer and fewer people because newer people come and go and whatever. So this way I know. Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, uh, you probably wouldn't know this, but there's a, the HR people have a little uh, kind of mailing list that tracks every person who comes and every person who goes mm -hmm. it's onboarding and offboarding and these, whatever. And I ask to be on that list so that I know every time someone arrives and every time someone leaves mm -hmm. uh, just to get sort of in my head, what's sort of happening to the graph that's in my head. Um, and I put graphs together because it's a way that I think about the relationships between people and organizations. So it's split up across six pages and it's split up the way it's split up because that's how I think about the organization. And I want to move those things around and, and, uh, and kind of see the way the, the data structures uh, relate to one another. So uh, I guess that makes me a visual thinker, uh, but really it's about relationships between entities. Yep, makes sense. Uh, that makes me sound like a nerd, but anyway, it's, it's what I do for fun. Yeah. <laughs> On, on the one hand, I am my mind is blown that we're letting you directly edit the website and <laughs> not and taking your time away from other things that you're doing. But on the other hand, it makes you happy. It gives you a sense for who everybody is. So it makes sense. You want, you want, to, you want to hear something crazy? So uh, we got I won't bore you with the details, but we got asked a question about compliance uh, that I found out about. Long story, but anyway, there's a handbook. There's a College of Computing handbook, which you can get to from the internet. I know you've read it multiple times. Um, and I actually wrote it or wrote most of it uh, originally when I was in my two previous jobs ago uh, because we needed to have one. Uh, and I realized yesterday, it was literally yesterday when I got asked this question, that it hadn't been updated in like five years. Uh, most of the stuff doesn't need to be updated, but like there's this whole section about who the dean is and who the associate deans are. And, you know, a few things about the, um, what each of the, what the portfolios of the associate deans are. And I realized, man, this hasn't been updated in years. So while being in another meeting, um, I went in and I edited the, the whole handbook and, and rewrote it to uh, reflect the current state of affairs. Not because I don't have anything to do, but because it needed to reflect what was actually going on because that's the purpose of that handbook. So, uh, and it helped me, I said, you know what, this is an excuse for me to think about how things have changed in the last five years and whether things we have written down are no longer make sense. And so it was a very useful exercise to me. I can't do these kinds of things every day or even every week or probably even every month, but some things that give you a way to kind of uh, give you an anchor to what's happening, a sort of reminder. And by the way, really nice a reminder of how things have changed. It's, it's a really important kind of sanity check that you're still heading in the direction that you thought you were headed. In. Hmm. So there you go. You're right. I shouldn't be doing any of that stuff. But of all the things I shouldn't be doing, that's a thing that I'm okay with doing. Well put. Um, what do you tend to think about when you're not actively trying to think about something? What goes on in the back burner to the extent that you're aware of it? Nothing. I enjoy very little more than not thinking about anything. I love it. It's wonderful. And you're able to achieve it. Mm -hmm. There's just, and you're able to achieve it. It's just nothing. Yeah. There's just nothing. So I, I live in a, um, I have, uh, I live in Atlanta, of course, which as you know, is the world's largest urban forest. Uh, and it is a beautiful place to spend time. And in particular, I live in a place called Peachtree City, uh, which is the largest golf cart community in the country. Uh, I did not I, know that. And it's, it's wonderful. It's 110, 120 miles of golf cart paths. They're like laws that require that everything be reached by golf cart. It's, it's kind of crazy. But I live in this nice house, and uh, the house is on um, a uh, on a golf course. And in particular, my house oversees the 17th green. So one of the things I enjoy doing, particularly on a, a day like today, where it's um, about 90 degrees, but there's enough of a breeze, I, I will sit underneath my deck, and I will listen to music, and I will read comic books or I will go on Twitter or whatever it is that I'm doing to shut off my brain and just enjoy people very far away from me playing golf, right? I won't call it Zen, but it is a very relaxing and kind of centering while, you know, sort of experience. You just kind of watch these people you don't know and see a piece of their life as they go by 
cursing because they missed a putt or whatever, while you're listening to music and just kind of enjoying the breeze. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And it's a place where I often find myself just kind of staring off into the middle distance and watching a duck or something or not, and just kind of time passes by. It's very nice. Oh, that, that sounds really re relaxing. That's oh, it is. It is fantastic. I just installed two big outdoor fans. These things, man, like they could, they could like lift a jet airplane. It's really nice. And just kind of have them going by and the wind sort of goes and just kind of listening to music and reading comic books and it's, or playing uh, Plants vs. Zombies, uh, which is what I, I tend to do a lot of, and just kind of relaxing and shutting up your brain. It's great. Are you happy with the number of close friends you have? Yes. And I'll tell you why, because I don't, I, so by the way, my guess is people who encounter me um, think of me as an extrovert. I'm actually not an extrovert. Uh, well, I kind of am an extrovert, but it's, it's more of a, um, uh, when it comes to social situations, I much more enjoy having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone or a one-on-two -on or three conversation with someone. Once it gets bigger than that, it's, it feels more like a performance, right? So I, I need to, so I enjoy teaching because I enjoy the performance of teaching to 348 students at a time and, you know, engaging them in the thing that I care about. But the energy is not coming from the, the people and the party. It's coming from the being able to just sort of bring them along with something. And that's very different from we're having a social interaction. When I think about friendship, it's a small number of people with whom you talk about things that you care about and they talk to you about things that, that they care about. And you don't need 20 of those. You don't need 10 of those. You just need a few. Um, people who get you and that you're basically investing time in um, and they're investing time in you. Uh, and so, yes, I've been lucky enough to have, have had a lot of really good friends um, in different parts of my life. And um, I'm very happy with, with them and I hope they're, you know, they're happy with what I brought to the relationship as well. Yeah. What are you insecure about? <laughs> um, my forehand flick and ultimate frisbee. <laughs> it should be better than it is. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I, I just, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I just, uh, I just, I like to, ju I just sort of reject the premise, right? I, I just, in, if, in, so insecurity is a word that has a meaning. And, uh, and I think with respect to its meaning, it makes a lot of sense, but it also has beyond its denotation, a connotation, right? So I kind of reject the connotation, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not insecure in the sense that I'm afraid that I'm not good enough for something. I am insecure in the sense that I am aware that there are things that I do not do well. Hmm. Um, perhaps some of them are things I should do better. But insecurity feels like the wrong word to describe that. So I am comfortable with recognizing that there are things that I don't do well or could do better or should spend more time on. And I'm comfortable both at the level of skills and at the level of kind of interacting. But insecurity just feels like the wrong way to describe that. Right? It's okay. It's okay to not be like I can't dunk anymore. Right? Okay, am, that's fine. I, I am I'm so jealous that that sentence is anymore. Like <laughs> <laughs> look, when I was young, so this would have been sometime around the time they invented fire, I had a 36 inch vertical, like NBA level vertical. I could get my entire arm in a hoop. <laughs> If I've got a three inch vertical now, I mean, I'd be pretty impressed, right? Um, by the way, I was never good at basketball despite the fact that I could jump that high because uh, basically I'm, you know, like 2,600 vision, I couldn't see anything. Um, and I was a terrible offensive player. I was a pretty decent defensive player in basketball, terrible offensive player. Um, and, you know, that's fine. I wasn't that good. Uh, I, was, I wasn't terrible, but I wasn't that good. And uh, that's fine, that's fine. And my answer, what I, you know, if you put me on a team and say, well, we need you to do this, then I know I can't do it, but that's not insecurity, right? That's just being aware of mm -hmm. your limitations and accepting them. Uh, so I think it's fine. So my answer to your question is, I don't know what I'm insecure about, but I could tell you some things that I could do better. I've told you at least 
one, um, uh, maybe two. And there's a few other things that I could get better at and should get better at, but I don't feel insecure about them. Do you think you're average, below average, or above average happy compared to the people around you? The people around me? Um, I think averages aren't useful hmm. when you're describing bimodal distributions. So I, I feel like I'm in one of the modes. And in that mode, I am probably in the median, but there are other modes. And I just, I don't think I'm, I'm even, I'm not in those modes. So um, I, I suspect that I am comfortable. I am more comfortable than a lot of people are. Um, and I've been, and, and the world and, you know, has been structured in such a way that, um, I'm allowed to be comfortable most of the time. And so I'm okay with that. I think a lot of the people around me are excited. They are interested in doing what they do. They see a way in which they're going to impact the world and they're trying to impact that world. And that is the principal component that matters here. Happiness is important, obviously, uh, but it is in some ways beside the point right? Because it's the struggle is the exercise, right? It's just trying to, trying to have that imprint on the world, trying to be immortal, right? And the happiness part of it is it can be a motivator, can be a result, but it's, it's not the first question I ask myself. Having said that, I do know people who I think are very explicitly, even structurally incapable of being happy, um, and so never will be, but it's not clear to me that they aren't content. Mm. So there you go. I think, I think, I think I am very on board with the way uh, the world is going and I'm surrounded by people who, even when they're frustrated, even when they're angry, even when they wish things were different are still optimistic. Maybe that's the word. Maybe that's the question I want to answer. I think I am more optimistic than most. And I don't know if that makes me happy or unhappy, but I'm definitely fundamentally optimistic. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, do you find your optimism tempered by reality checks or do you find that's, uh, uh, you know, unbiased optimism that even in the face of uh, negative news uh, or negative projections, you continue to maintain that optimism? Um, I maintain the optimism. Hmm. Uh, so a story some people know about me, right, is that, you know, gosh, this would have been, I mean, at this point, it's been almost 30 years, but I, you know, I once had a cop pull a gun on me and put it in my face, right? And, you know, I, you know, that was not a fun experience uh, at all. And I've had more than one kind of interaction uh, of that sort um, uh, over the years of my life, including well into my adult life and, and even relatively recently. And, you know, I still come away from those, you know, I, I made it out alive and it didn't have to be that way, but it is. So I constantly find the world is not living up to its promise uh, or its potential. But I think at the end of the day, I just kind of think it can. And so long as we keep trying, maybe it will. And, you know, that's kind of the best that you can do. So despite having the world occasionally remind me that it's not perfect, uh, say every time I open up Twitter, for example, um, it is still the case that you see signs of headed in the right direction. You see signs of possibility. You mentioned the, the NERPS talk earlier. I, you know, there, I think there are two ways to, to think about that problem, the problem of kind of the ethical use of AI and the, the, the way that we think about the world. One is the world is really messed up, right? We, we have a bunch of people who, again, are solving the problem in front of them without worrying about the implications. And in fact, explicitly are desperately trying not to worry about the implications because it's easier. Um, we all have our own histories that go back centuries or even millennia of sort of unfair treatment of people. And one could come out of that and be very pessimistic. But another way to think about that discussion and think about that area is 
we recognize that it is an issue and that we believe there are solutions to it that don't require unicorns, but just require intention and thought. And then in fact, it turns out we've had the tools all along. We just have to kind of recognize them and, and refine them and make them better. And I think that is fundamentally optimistic. And that's optimism in the face of reality, as opposed to delusion in the face of reality. So I like to think that my optimism remains intact with the world occasionally making certain that I'm not being delusional. Makes sense. Makes sense. And Thank you for thank you for sharing that. I, I knew of the incident that you're describing. You had described it once in a in an internal Georgia Tech gathering. But thank you for sharing that here. Yeah, of course. What is something that you've changed your mind about? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Calvin and Hobbes, which is that my opinions may have changed, but not the fact that I'm right. So I tend not to think about the things that I've actually changed my mind about, even though I changed my mind about a lot of things, right? I, one of the things that, uh, if you look at the emails that I send out, I have a line at the bottom of it, which is don't just adopt opinions, develop them. Mm -hmm. And I try very much to think, to think about that, that you know, it, it's okay to have an opinion about something so long as you recognize that you've thought about it or you haven't thought enough about it. So there are lots of things I've walked in thinking the world is one way and then being convinced that it isn't. And that happens all the time. That's how it happened as recently as this week on something internal that has to do with policy and process in Georgia Tech, um, which I, I will not bore you with. Um, but it, so it happens all the time that I change my mind about things, but I prefer to think of it as revising my model of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then... So, you know, I mean, if you think carefully about it, so much of the way I operate in the universe appears to be about um, avoiding ever being wrong, right? So it's, it's about, if I'm revising, then it's okay, because I wasn't actually wrong, I just learned more. If, um, yeah, so I think, <laughs> I think there's perhaps a lot of that uh, in the way that I, I kind of deal with, deal with the world. I don't have to be uncomfortable with something because, you know, I got better at it. I don't have to be insecure about it because the future still exists and there's a chance to, there's a chance to get better. I'm trying to think of some, so that's my answer to your question, but I'm trying to think of something that was really, really big that I sort of changed my mind about. And I don't think the only things I can think of in that space have to do with kind of social realities of the way people live that, that are completely outside of my personal experience. But that felt less like having changed my mind than suddenly being made aware hmm. of something that I had simply never thought about. That happens a lot, right? Hmm. That there are people who experience the world in a way radically different from the way that I do. And that that is not just a legitimate view of the world, but it's common, right? Hmm. And that I have to think about that in order to accomplish the things that I want to accomplish. That happens a lot. Yeah, that happens a lot. But I don't think, I don't, you know, that seems perfectly fine to me. I mean, you would kind of want it to be that way. Yeah, because the only way to not be in that state is to have just a perfect replica of, of the world, of a static world in your yeah. head, which, yeah. yeah. And the world isn't static and it's always changing. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really liked your phrasing of, uh, revising and updating your models. Uh, and I, I was almost surprised uh, Bellman updates didn't show up in that description. <laughs> well, that's all, I mean, I mean, well, that was just intuitively obvious and it's the most casual observer. So, you know, that was just implicit in everything that I was saying. Yeah. But yeah, that's about right, isn't it? Yeah. Left as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> yes. One of my favorite expressions. <laughs> what is a bad habit you're working on overcoming? Ugh. Um, sugar mm. food is delicious and uh <laughs> sugar is especially delicious and i just you know i don't i don't you know eat my sadness as it were but i definitely uh i definitely eat my happiness and uh i, I need to stop doing it uh that's even that's even worse given how content and happy you are <laughs> with the world. oh man i just it's just uh just i have to just pay more attention it's just uh it's really easy it, it's it's um 
it's it's a it's a really bad habit. Uh, I just uh, you know I grab the thing that's in front of me because it's easy and I know better, uh, but I do it anyway. Um, that's the thing I'm thinking about most because I'm hitting that age where I suddenly have to start worrying about you know that whole I'm going to live forever and there'll be no consequences to any of the health decisions that I make. I'm past that stage, uh, and so I'm really having to think kind of hard about it. That's a bad habit, and that by the way is a it's a stand-in for a bunch of bad habits like that. Right? Mm. It's you know, I'm picking the one, but there's a whole class of them <laughs> that are like that, that uh, I absolutely need to break. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, where the mental acceptance of the things that you can no longer sustain has yet not arrived. Yeah. And, and yeah. And when I get there, I'll let you know. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I can see it in the distance, but <laughs> I haven't quite accepted the inevitability of a whole bunch of things. Although I'll say, you know, when I was what I used to do, I haven't done this in. Uh, a couple of years, but every once in a while, uh, I will become a vegetarian or a pescatarian mm. for um, three or four months. I'll usually pick a date, like you know, I'll, I'll, to the end of the semester or something like that. Mm. Um, not because I intend on doing it forever, but because I want to prove to myself I can if I ever have to. Mm. And I've discovered a lot of things, including that uh, I don't like most vegetables, uh, and that I really like bacon. Um, there's a bunch of things I've learned about myself in that process, but the, it was the, the point of the exercise was to go, well, one day when a doctor tells me mm. I'm going to have to start eating vegetables and nothing else, for the, I'll, I'll, be, I'll know that I'm capable of doing it. Mm. So I do stuff like that every once in a while. It's been, a, been about two years since the last time I went through that, but um, it's, been, it's, it's a helpful exercise. It's actually something that I'd recommend to people, not necessarily being a vegetarian, but doing something that you kind of know in your heart you're going to have to do one day for just a short period of time so that you'll know that when it comes, you'll be able to handle it. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. And for me, that's food. How do you imagine your retirement? I'm sorry, what? How do you imagine your retirement? Oh, my retirement. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. that I'm also at the age now to think about that sort of thing. Um, I, I plan to be busy. I, uh, I mean, if you think about, so I do a lot of things day to day, including filling out paperwork and making decisions. Um, but, you know, you asked me earlier, you know, what the best part of my day is, and it's, you know, thinking about problem solving and thinking about things, right? Luckily, I mean, the job puts me in a position where I get new ones of those every couple of hours, uh, but I don't need a job to think about problems, right? I don't need a job to try to kind of decide uh, what's a thing that's worth learning or what's a thing that's worth doing or what's a book that's worth reading. Uh, and so I'm hoping my retirement will continue at least in that way to look very similar to what it is I'm, I'm doing now. I'm hoping to, once I'm no longer in a job, to you know sit on boards, to um, volunteer for a variety of things where I can continue to have some kind of impact until I'm no longer able to do so. Um, and, you know, the stakes will be different, but I don't think they'll be any lower. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm hoping to be, as opposed mm-hmm. to traveling. Uh, I travel a lot now. I'm sure I'll continue to, but the goal isn't to get away from the things that I've been doing. It's just to have a more uh, leisurely way of doing the things that I enjoy doing now. Mm-hmm. And do you have a place in mind? I don't plan on selling my current house. Mm, that's no nice. No matter what happens. I'm gonna, I would like to sit back there and watch 80 year old men curse every time they miss a putt for the next 40 years. Even if I, even if I leave Atlanta and I go someplace else, I I plan on coming back to that. With the giant fans, with the giant fans blowing in the. (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'll I'll have more fans by then. It'll be great. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So let's try to make a falsifiable prediction. Uh, When do you think our part of the world will open back up post COVID. And I realize that you have a lot of like privileged information because you are actively planning for that world. I think it will, it's, it's any minute now. What, what has really surprised me about where we happen to be at this point, there's a timestamp saying when this all was done, I don't know, but um, there's, is how quickly we pivoted back to everything's normal-ish. Um, 
you know, you asked me this question three months ago, I would have said, well, I don't know, six months and it'll be slow and whatever. Now, it turns out it was a little bit faster. It appears to be moving a little bit faster, but more importantly, it's happening very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, although, so, you know, we, we talk about, you know, you talk about what your personal experiences are and kind of empathy. It's clear to me that different people, and we just stick with uh, the U.S., Different people are having very different experiences of the world right now and what the pandemic is. There are people who never stop going to work every day. There are people who've been living in Zoom and blue jeans and everything else and um, Cisco and whatever else, and Microsoft Teams and whatever platforms are out there so that I don't show any bias. Um, you know, their experiences are radically different. So when you talk about our part of the world, right, you're, you're, you're actually talking about even inside that part of the world, at least four or five different ones mm. and their experiences are all very different from one another i mm. think for a lot there has been no change it's been open the whole time um there's just been fewer other people around and then for some it's felt radically different um i've been coming to work two days a week on average uh going back to uh the middle of last summer mm. and i've watched people come and go and I've seen sort of how it's changed. The campus, by the way, looks radically different from the way it looked a year ago. There's like new building. Construction workers never stopped constructing. Like things are happening. The trees have been, I mean, it's just a very different, a very different kind of place. So I think we are going, for the people for whom things have felt closed, which isn't everyone, perhaps not even the majority of people, even in our world, um, that I think will happen slowly and with a lot of agency by those people. For everybody else, I think it's going to open up right away. And by the time fall comes around, it'll be kind of the way it's always been for a whole set of those people. Mm-hmm. And then there'll be a subset of people for whom it will not be true for months and months and months and months and months. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if there's nothing else that being in this job for the last year or so has told me or taught me is that you really do have to treat each of those groups you have to appreciate what each of those groups are differently going. Um, but at a high level bit, I think fall semester will look like almost every other fall semester. The students will be on campus. That will force a whole set of other issues and will more or less be back to normal. Now, here's another question you might have asked me is, are we ever going back to normal? Or how are things going to look different, particularly in higher ed and for the way research is done? I think the answer is a lot more normal than we currently think. Um, but there will be a few key decisions that we as a community are gonna to have to make. Like, do we really want to go back to conferences the way they used to be? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we're able to do some really cool things we weren't able to do before uh, because things were remote and you could do things like record a 45 hour, 45 minute movie um, and say it's your talk um, that involves 15 other people, right? There, there are things that you could do that mm-hmm. just weren't possible before. By the way, it's a lot of work, so I'm not sure most people want to do it. I mean, most people don't have a communications department to help them with it. And a friend they've been doing things like this with together for, you know, almost 10 years and, you know, with whom they have a good, uh, they they have a good writing relationship and all that. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is. Like, I don't know if we want to go back or if we, we really do want to go back. I just don't know. I mean, I, I miss traveling. I miss seeing people. I miss conferences, even though I don't go to them as often as I used to. I mean, there's something important about being in the same physical space. On the other hand, you can have literally an order of magnitude more people involved. So we're gonna have to figure out some way to do both of those things. What I worry about, actually, and and by the way, I could take what I just said about conferences and we could talk about teaching on campus. We could Mm -hmm. talk about, you know, pick, pick pick whatever part of life you wanna pick. There's a similar kind of, trade-off there, um, uh, in, including, by the way, how do you do things like remote um, support for people who, it turns out, can't come on campus to deal with mental health issues, for example, or, mm-hmm. or medical issues, or, or to be advised? Are we going to have to provide more mechanisms for, for reaching out to them, all of which costs money, all of which costs time, and all of which requires training um, and changing the way that we do things? And I think that I don't know where that's going to end up, but I do know that it's a whole series of decisions that we're collectively going to have to make. And I don't know what the outcome is, but I do know that the, it will, it will perforce be different from what we were doing. 
And what I worry about is that it will be differently different so that we will construct a world such that the elite will still go to conferences and the rest won't. And that's where the networking will happen. And that's rich get richer, positive feedback loop. And that would be incredibly easy to construct. In fact, that would be the default. The default would be to, in the name of expanding access, would be to create multiple tiers. And once you're in the right group, positive feedback works. And while you're outside that group, you don't have access. You don't even realize you don't have. In fact, what's bad about these kinds of things is the people on the outside don't even realize what it is they're missing. And the people on the inside don't realize what they have. And so you create these kind of false worlds of, of expectations uh, that kind of perpetuate um, these differences and these inequities. So I think that's actually the biggest, the biggest um, concern we should all have and the, the biggest risk that we're taking is not that we won't figure out how to use technology it's that we will figure out how to use technology and we will actually make things worse in a way that won't be visible to people. Yeah, yeah. And, and the pernicious thing about setting up a world like that, as you correctly pointed out, is you don't even realize what you don't have access to because you just, it's, right. it's not that 10% of the time you get to attend it. It's just you are always yeah. being slotted into a... a a tier that just doesn't have ever access to those sorts of things. So, yeah. Yeah. I worry about that, but I, I, I think on balance, it'll be good, but it will not be as good as it could be unless we are very intentional about it and replace that with restaurants, replace that with working at home, replace that with conferences, replace that with teaching, pick, pick whatever. There's some trade-off like that in every sector and aspect of our lives. We're just not, and it's going to be really hard to think about it because it's so much, it's so complicated. There's so many people involved, um, but hopefully we'll hopefully we'll at least try to do the right thing. Yeah. So maybe a maybe a more philosophical question that tends to uh, that, that tends to uh, amuse people when I ask them this with a straight face. Uh, do you think there's a point to life and our existence? <laughs> so uh, it's funny you ask this. I've, I've, I've been thinking about this this a lot, and um, I will I will uh, slaughter one of my favorite quotes, which is let's see if I can get it right. Every time I say it, it's a little different, but here's 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 roughly what it says. It is well worth remembering that, save for one trifling exception, the universe is composed entirely of others. So to me, the point of life is others. And by the way, I don't say that as I'm a good person and I want you to like me and you know, think, look how much I care about the rest of the universe. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is the universe is composed of other people. And if you think about what it means to be immortal, if you think about what it means to have impact, that's only truly measurable on its impact, its effect, its long range on others. People remember you because of the things that you've done not because of how you felt at the moment, right? Um, so I think the point of life is the impact that life has on other life, which is, uh, you know, a nicely closed system view of the universe. But I think that's that's what it is. The alternative is, it, the alternative is there is no point. And I think that it's okay if the universe doesn't think we have a point, because one of the great things about life is that we can choose to have a point. And I choose it to be the impact on others. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, on to perhaps uh, even more philosophical debates. Uh, sure. Pineapple on pizza, yummy or no? Oh, it's not yummy at all. <laughs> I uh, but I I support your right to make terrible decisions. And if you want to make a terrible decision about having pineapple on pizza, that is up to you. I will take pineapple on pizza over um, a bunch of other things, though, including anchovies. By the way, having one slice of Hawaiian pizza, so that's pepperoni, ham, and whatever else it goes, or maybe Canadian bacon, whatever else goes on there, one bite of that every four or five years is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But one should not make it a habit. <laughs> Or at least if one does, then one should try significantly hard to, to get one to get rid of that bad habit. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a bad habit. And also to hide it from others. Don't don't let other people know. Yeah. 
No, I'm not a big. I love pineapple, by the way. It's actually my favorite fruit juice. Um, are there some traits that you find common across some of the best collaborators or colleagues that you've worked with? Yes. Um, actually, the, <laughs> I would say there's one which is going to feel uh, self-evident, which is that they genuinely like to collaborate. I mean, there are people who will work with you, but they don't think of, it's not really a collaboration, right? But people who can think outside of themselves, right? You know, what's better for the organization, the group, the whatever, those people, those people are fun to work with. And I think you get the kind of most impact out of them. But of course, there are other traits. And I think the one, <laughs> the other one I like is that they're very interesting, right? Um, and they can think about, we're not just working on this thing, but this is one of multiple things we will work on. There's a future here. There's a, this is an ongoing conversation and we really care about interesting problems. Those people are the ones who are fun to work with. You know, We're trying to do something that's bigger. It's gonna have a big deal. For me personally, beyond the, those kind of traits uh, is just, I, I really like working with people who genuinely want to do something big, right? Even if it doesn't work out that way, but they really, really want to. Maybe, you know, we won't be able to get that far, but you know, really, really want to change something big. I, I just find that inspiring. So I like hanging out with people, but if you truly like to collaborate, that is you want to work with other people, you don't worry about getting the credit, the right thing will happen eventually. Um, and you know, you're, you're, you're interested in being interesting and you know a lot. And so the, one of the ways that works, right, is because your, your conversations aren't about just the problem that you're working on, right? You end up having these conversations about other things and you know, coming to the conclusion that pineapple on pizza is a terrible idea, right? I mean, you, you have these kind of conversations. I have lots of people I collaborate with outside of research, uh, outside of my, my, uh, my administrative job. Um, and these are people I just want to hang out with uh, anyway, right? So if I want to hang out with you anyway, then the rest, the rest, the rest comes, right? The rest comes. Yeah. And do you think you're able to spot these traits early? Do I think what? Do you think you're able to spot these traits early? Uh, yes. I may have false negatives, but I rarely have false positives. Hmm. Well, that sense. was a very, that was a very machine learning thing to say, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> But there you go. I mean, that's been a running theme, uh, and I would expect <laughs> I would I would expect nothing less. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's, I, it's I, also it's also extremely precise. Yeah. I mean, it's how I kind of feel about the world. We we tend to, you know, wherever you are in the ROC curve, most problems come from dialing too far in one direction versus the other, and the secret is that you can get it just right. Yeah. yeah. Describe something that made you smile this week. <laughs> I, this is a, a very specific thing. So I discovered um, pitch meetings this week. What are pitch meetings? It's a, it's a, a thing that's a part of Screen Rant, which is a, an account on YouTube. Hmm. So uh, I'm a big fan of um, uh, things like uh, Honest Trailers and how it should have ended, which you either know about or you don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And YouTube has been trying to tell me for months now that I should be looking at something called pitch meetings. And I just like, no, it looks stupid. It just, I just didn't want to do it. Anyway, I don't know how, but I stumbled into a pitch meeting and it is just one of the most delightful things. I just have enjoyed it. I've been doing nothing but like hours of watching, you know, pitch meetings. Uh, I highly recommend, if, you, if you've heard of, you know, how it should have ended or honest trailers. You just like movies or TV shows and people's takes on them. I absolutely recommend finding uh, this series of videos. This just has made me, uh, this made me laugh and I've just enjoyed it. Probably to the detriment of other things I should be doing, but I really, I really enjoy it. That's the thing that's, that I discovered in the last three or four days that I've really, really enjoyed. The other thing uh, that's made me smile, um, uh, is my my son uh, keeps discovering new puns, and he keeps telling them to me. And I won't tell you what he said, but he did he did come up to me with a pun that he made up, and 
I just found it great. And I just found myself smiling. That that was terrible. And I really, truly appreciate it. That's very personal. But the, uh, I go, go see, go, go watch pitch meetings on Screen Rant. It's on YouTube. It's just, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I think that's a that's a beautiful and happy note to to stop at. Um, Charles, thank you for doing this. Uh, any any aspect of your life or any last minute thoughts that uh, that you think we should have talked about? Someone who wants to know you should be aware of uh, that that we should get to. Not really. I mean, I, I think. Uh, I mean, I'm sure I could come up with something. If I thought about it long enough, but I, I think. I think, you know. I, I think if someone wants to know me, I think, you know, they should just take it at face value. I mean, I, this is what I'm, I'm doing. This is who I am. Um, and um, there's not much more there. I'm thinking about things, but this is who I am. Because what's the point otherwise? If you really want to understand me, I highly recommend reading a book. And that book is The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty, which is a very 1990s book. Hmm. Uh, Paul Beatty, by the way, uh, I think that was the second book. His first book was Big Bank Take Little Bank. He was a poet. Uh, he's won the Booker Prize relatively recently. He was the first American to do so. Anyway, uh, maybe not the Booker Prize. It's some, some big book prize. Maybe that's why I said Booker. Anyway, people who know what I'm talking about will know what I'm talking about. Um, but I love that book. And uh, I haven't read it in about three years, maybe four or five years now. Uh, so, so maybe I'll regret having other people read it. But uh, when I was of a certain age, I just felt like that completely captured the world. So even if I'm wrong in 2020, I'm going to live with the nostalgia of having read that book. So people should read that book. Sounds good. Thank you. And thank you for doing this. Thank you. I'm more than happy to anytime. <laughs>